friends, it's your teen and tween librarian Rebecca and we're back for another episode of Bedtime Stories. Uh, last episode, they finally figured out which chimney to use to descend into the crater. So now, the real journey begins. But first, just a reminder, if you haven't signed up for summer reading yet, now is the time. Go ahead and you can visit this website here and you can get set up with Beanstack, which is the program we're using to track summer reading this year. You can track on that website, you can use a paper log if you want, or you can download the Beanstack Tracker app um, and track all your reading and activities there. Um, we have some great prizes to end the summer and we have some really fun activities, so definitely sign up, it'll be worth your while. But let's get into the story. Enjoy chapter 17. Chapter 17, Our Real Journey Begins. The real journey was beginning. So far, our labors had been greater than our difficulties. Now, the latter were literally to spring up at every step. I had not yet looked down into the bottomless pit into which I was about to plunge, but now the time had come. I could either resign myself to the whole business or refuse to take part in it. But I was ashamed to draw back in the presence of our guide. Hans was treating the adventure so calmly, so unconcernedly, with such a total disregard for any possible danger, that I blushed at the idea of being less courageous than he was. If I'd been alone, I would have brought out all of my old arguments, but in the presence of the guide, I remained silent. My mind conjured up the memory of my pretty Virlandes, and I walked across to the central chimney. I have already said that it was a hundred feet in diameter, or three hundred feet in circumference. I leaned over a projecting rock and looked down. My hair stood on end. The fascination of the void took hold of me. I felt my center of gravity moving and vertigo rising to my head like intoxication. There is nothing more overwhelming than this attraction of the abyss. I was on the point of falling when a hand pulled me back. It was that of Hans. It was obvious that I had not taken enough lessons in abysses on the Frelser's Kirk in Copenhagen. Even so, however brief my examination of the chimney had been, I had seen how it was shaped. Its almost perpendicular walls were covered with countless projections, which would facilitate our descent. But if the staircase was there all right, the banisters were missing. A rope fastened to the edge of the opening might help us on our way down, but how could we unfasten it when we arrived at the other end? My uncle used a very simple method to get over this difficulty. He uncoiled a rope about as thick as a thumb and 400 feet long. First, he let down half of it, then looped it over a projecting block of lava and threw the other half down. Each of us could then descend by holding onto both halves of the rope, which would not be able to unwind. When we were 200 feet down, nothing would be easier than to regain possession of the whole rope by letting go of one end and pulling on the other. Then this process would be repeated ad infinitum. Now, said my uncle after completing these preparations, let us see about the baggage. We're going to divide it into three packages and each of us will strap on one to his back. I'm talking about the fragile objects only. The professor obviously did not include us under that heading. Hans, he went on, we will take charge of the tools and some of the provisions. You, Axel, will take another third of the provisions together with the arms, and I will take the rest of the provisions and the delicate instruments. But, I said, who's going to take the clothes down and this pile of ropes and ladders? They will go down by themselves. What do you mean, I asked. You'll see. My uncle was fond of resorting to drastic measures and never hesitated. On his instructions, Hans tied all the non-fragile articles in a single bundle, roped them together securely, and threw them bodily down the chimney. I heard the loud rushing sound produced by the displacement of the layers of air. My uncle, leaning over the abyss, followed the descent of his baggage with a satisfied air, and only stood up when it had disappeared from sight. Good, he said, our turn now. 
Now I ask any honest person if this was possible to hear these words without a shudder. The professor fastened the package of instruments on his back. Hans took the one containing the tools, and I the one with the arms. The descent began in the following order, Hans, my uncle, and me. It took place in profound silence, disturbed only by the fall of loose stones hurtling into the abyss. I let myself fall, so to speak, frantically clutching the double rope with one hand and steadying myself with the other by means of my iron-shod stick. A single thought dominated my mind, the fear that the rock from which I was hanging might give way. The rope struck me as very fragile to bear the weight of three persons. I used it as little as possible, performing miracles of equilibrium on the lava projections which my feet tried to grip as if they were hands. Whenever one of these slippery steps shook under Hans's feet, he would say in his quiet voice, Gif acht. Be careful, repeated my uncle. After half an hour, we had reached the surface of a rock which was firmly attached to the wall of the chimney. Hans pulled one end of the rope and the other rose into the air and after passing round the projecting rock at the top of the chimney, came down, bringing with it a dangerous sort of rain, or rather hail, of stones and pieces of lava. Leaning over the edge of our narrow ledge, I observed that the bottom of the hole was still invisible. The maneuver with the rope was begun again, and a half an hour later we had descended another 200 feet. I doubt whether, during this descent, even the most enthusiastic geologist would have tried to study the nature of the surrounding rocks. For my part, I know that I did not trouble my head about them. It was all one to me whether they were Pliocene, Miocene, Eocene, Crustaceous, Jurassic, Triassic, Permian, Carboniferous, De Devonian, Silurian, or Primitive. But the professor was probably making observations or taking notes, for at one of our halts he said to me, the farther I go, the more confident I feel. The order of these volcanic formations fully confirms Davy's theory. We are in the middle of the primordial stratum, for in which the chemical operation took place of metals catching fire at the contact of air and water. I absolutely reject the idea of central heat. In any case, we shall soon see. His conclusion was always the same. Small wonder that I felt no desire to argue. My silence was taken for agreement and the descent began again. After three hours, I could still not see the bottom of the chimney. When I raised my head, I saw its opening growing perceptibly smaller. Its walls sloped slightly and were therefore drawing closer to each other. It was gradually getting darker. Still, we kept on descending. It seemed to me that the falling stones were making a duller sound on impact and that they were reaching the bottom of the abyss sooner. As I had taken care to keep an exact account of our maneuvers with the rope, I could calculate precisely what depth we had reached and how much time had gone by. We had now repeated the operation 14 times, and each descent took a half an hour. That made seven hours plus 14 quarters of an hour for rest, or three and a half hours. Altogether, 10 and a half hours we had started at one o'clock, so it now must be 11. As for the depth we had reached, these 14 operations with a rope 200 feet long made it 2,800 feet. At that moment, Hans called out, Halt! I stopped short just as I was going to hit my uncle's head with my feet. We have arrived, he said. Where? I asked, slipping down beside him. At the bottom of the chimney. Isn't there any other way out then? Yes, I can just make out a sort of corridor slanting away to the right. We'll see about that tomorrow. Let's have our supper first and then sleep. It was not yet completely dark. We had opened a bag of provisions, ate our meal, and settled down as best we could on a bed of stones and pieces of lava. When, lying on my back, I opened my eyes, I saw a bright point of light at the end of the 3,000 foot tube, which acted like a gigantic telescope. It was a star which did not appear to sparkle and which, according to my calculations, must have been B or some minor. And then I fell into a deep sleep. That's the end of chapter 17. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Bedtime Stories. 
Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to the library's YouTube channel. You can also find out what's happening at the library by visiting us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Or you can always just go to the library's website. I hope to see you again for the next episode of Bedtime Stories, but until then, be well and sleep well. Thank you.